Hello everyone and welcome back to another Warhammer Age of Sigmar Warcry Battle Report for the channel. This series is available early to the channel members by about a week, give or take. So if you would like to see these as soon as they're done, please do consider supporting the channel by becoming a channel member. You'll get early access to this and potentially some other videos. And you get a little thing next to your name for comments and access to some uh, member only posts as well. Plus it helps just... Uh, keep the channel going so I would greatly appreciate that but everybody will get to see it eventually and today is going to be the Night Haunts going up against the Maggotkin of Nurgle aka the Rockbringers um, on the map you can see before you will be randomizing the mission again fully from the old rulebook but the most up-to-date version of the rulebook is still being used as far as gameplay mechanics go so we'll take a look at both sides and then randomize what they're doing so here is the Night Haunt force today, largely comprising of the Headsman's Curse from Warhammer Underworlds. The rules for using them in Warcry were in White Dwarf issue, I think it's 492, the one with the, the red background and the Terminator on the front. Uh, Sans, the Sharpener of the Blade, who has been dropped in order to make room for a Tomb Banshee here. And we are also having the Knight of Shrouds as the leader and a Spirit Host at the back there. It comes to roughly 960 points, so not like perfectly ideal on the dot for a thousand. But it would have been even less without the Tomb Banshee, but with the Sharpener, there wasn't enough room to get them both in. If you aren't familiar with the Hitsman's Curse, though, we have the Executioner of the Blade over here. Uh, we have the Bearer of the Block, and we have the Scripter of the Sentence over there with the, so the big scroll. They have some unique doubles and triples they can spend that are also listed in the same White Dwarf. That also had rules for Skavik's Plague Pack, uh, Domitan's Storm Coven, and Ephilim's Pandemonium. If you can pick up a copy, it lets you use all of those in Warcry. And here is the Rockbringer's Force coming to, I believe it was 990 points, maybe it was 980, but I think it was 990 on the dot. Being led, once again, by the Harbinger at the back there. Fantastic model, the Harbinger of the K to use its full name. And everyone who is present is actually as they should be this time. There's no stand-ins or anything like that. So there is also the Lord of Plagues right here as a secondary hero. From the Underworld's crew, we have Sepsimus and we have Gulgok here. Then we also have a Sorcerer. So that's the three heroes in a line there. And then, as the kind of chaff... We have a Blight King with Blighted Whippin and a Blight King with Sonorous Toxin, which is his big bell as far as I'm aware. Gives him a unique uh, double or triple, I think. So they've got slightly more points than the Night Haunts. They're using their points a bit more efficiently. They're very slow but tanky. Night Haunts are actually pretty tanky as well. but They're very fast though, so depending on the type of mission we roll, one team might have a clear advantage. Time to go see. This video is sponsored by Noble Knight Games. Check out the video description below for an affiliate link that will take you through to their store and it will help me out as well. Thanks. So here we are, table A, table B. So this will be one to three, four to six to see which one we're rolling on. It's gonna be the one on the right here and then it's just a straight roll because there are six potential options. I don't think I really rolled that, but I guess we'll take it. It got a six, so it is divide and slaughter in the bottom right there. All three groups, which we'll show who they're broken into in a second, of uh, the Hammer, Dagger and Shield. Oh, actually no, the Hammers come on round two. So the Shields and Daggers start on the field, and the Blue Team's Dagger starts directly in the centre. So that'll be the deployment type used. Now we need to see the mission being used. Same again, one, two, three, four, six. Okay, we're, we're always on the right, apparently. A two would be... Victory condition is crush. The players roll off and the winner decides who's the attacker and who's the defender. That dictates who's red, who's blue. If every fighter in the defender's dagger is taken down, the attackers win the battle. Otherwise, at the end of the fourth battle round, the defender wins the battle. Any fighters from the defender's dagger that are within four inches of the battlefield edge at the end of a battle round immediately count as being taken down. So, they, I guess they get eaten by the world or something. So it's the daggers that are important here. Well, the defender's dagger. And as I just pointed out, oh, that actually kind of thematically fits, doesn't it? The dagger that's getting hunted is going to start in the middle of the table because I'm pretty sure blue's defender. All right, we'll work out who's who and which battle groups are which and be back. The Rockbringers won the roll-off and have decided to be the defenders. Their dagger, which is the one starting within three inches of the middle of the map, is going to be the Harbinger, the Blight King with Sonder's Toxin, and the Lord of Plague. So if all three of them are dead, the Night Haunts win. Their shield, which starts on the map within 
uh, a couple of inches of them actually four inches in from the table edge down here is Septimus and the Sorcerer and then coming in at round two off the far right of your screen is the Hammer which is the other Blight King and then also Gulgok. And here's how the Night Haunt have separated themselves so their dagger which will be coming in on the left flank of the table just above that dice actually is going to be the Spirit Host and the Tomb Banshee then we have the Bearer of the Blade, Wielder of the Blade, I called him something wrong when we are going over um, he's the Wielder of the Blade I call him the Executioner, I think, because that's what he does. He executes people. But he's part of the shield with the Knight of the Shrouds. Knight of Shrouds. They're imposing the biggest threat on the dagger of the Rockbringers because they are a couple of inches away from the centre of the table as well. And then coming in late at round two, their hammer, which comes in behind the shield of the defenders, so the table edge down here, is the Bearer of the Block and the Scripter of the Sentence. So after the daggers and shields have set up on the table, this is how it's looking within three inches of where the markers are on the deployment setup, so they have that much to play with. So Septimus is over here with the sorcerer who's taken the high ground. In the middle are the three targets. They're the three that need to die for the Night Haunt to win. So we have the Sonorous Toxin wielding Blight King, the Harbinger of Decay, and then down here, out of the line of sight, is the Lord of Plagues. Immediately threatening them over here, Knight of Shrouds and the Wielder slash Bearer of the Blade. And then over here on the left, I guess, is Spooky Ghost Corner, because that's where the Spirit Host and the Tomb Banshee is. Everyone else is coming on on the second round. So now we'll go to dice and see who's getting first activation and also what doubles, triples, quads they have to play with. So here's the dice. The Night Haunts are in the black dice this time and the Rockbringers are in the red. They started with a double and four singles, basically guaranteeing them. Uh, first activation in the round. They used their wild dice to make the threes into a triple. The Rubbringers had a double four and a double three. Knowing that they're losing first activation, they opted to use their wild dice as well to turn a single six into a double. To see what they can do with that. Because of where everyone's deployed in this one, the fighting is going to start thick and fast. So we're going to see how it is. Jump into round one of potentially four, depending on how well the Night Hunt do with the rolls, I guess. Night Hunt's picking first. Let's see what happens. So for the Night Haunts it was the Wielder of the Blade to activate first, using his first action to move 6 inches to get within 1 inch of the Harbinger of Decay and the Blight King with the Sonorous Toxin that's just out of line of sight down there. He spent their triple on a unique for the Headsman's Curse, you have to have the Headsman's Curse rune mark to be able to do it, it's called Hold Them Still. Pick an enemy fighter within 1 inch of this fire, he chose the Harbinger of Decay because, well, he's quote unquote fast, he's Nurgle fast. That fighter cannot make disengage actions until the end of the round. In addition, subtract the value of this ability, in this case it was 3, from the move characteristic until the end of the battle round, a minimum of 0. So that also covers if he somehow manages to get himself killed, um, the Harbinger will still be minus 3 movement. But if as long as he's alive, he can't disengage from the combat. The Sonorous Toxin wielding Blight King can, if he chooses to run away, but it was important to kind of hold that horse down because he actually is quote-unquote fast and could just run away and try and just survive on the edge of a table. So he swung at him for his other action. Two attacks at strength five, meaning he was hitting on threes because he was going up against toughness four. And it's a pretty powerful ability. He did only get one hit through though, a normal hit for three wounds. He crits, or if he gets a crit, he hits for six damage. Like he is very, very strong. Only 20 wounds though, so he's not super hard to kill. But he did three wounds of the 20, oh, 28, I believe, no, 25, sorry, wounds that the Harbinger has. First activation for the Rockbringers was that Sonorous Toxin wielding Blight King, who did eventually use his second action to do a disengage, because he's allowed to disengage, uh, which is a three inch move backwards. But he spent their double three on Toll of the Sonorous Toxin. Until the end of the next battle round, add one to the move characteristic of friendly fighters that make a move action that start within 7 inches of this fighter. So it doesn't help him because it disengages a different action to a movement action, but it might help the Lord of Plagues move, or help Septimus or the Sorcerer get into better positions. So he's got that little buff and they spent their double 3, which was the lowest double they had. Before doing that disengage action from the Wielder of the Blade, Bearer of the Blade, I forget every single time, he swung at him, 4 attacks, strength 4, against toughness 4 and only managed to get one there on the roll which is sadly just a single wound to the ghost. Taking advantage of the opportunity to gang up on the Harbinger of Decay, the Knight of Shrouds activated and moved his 6 inches into combat with the Harbinger and took a swing at him with his Sword of Stolen Hours which is a wonderful name for a weapon. 4 attacks at strength 4 
2 4 damage. He got 3 hits through, one of which was a crit for a total of 8 more wounds, putting the Harbinger at 11 uh, damage done of his whatever it was 25. So he's starting to hurt and he can't run away. Well, even though he wasn't allowed to run away, the Harbinger of Decay activated for the Rockbringers next, and he just started swinging that scythe like a madman at the Knight of Shrouds. So it was leader versus leader, uh, four dice, strength four with two four split damage. His first set of attacks into the Knight of Shrouds did five, six, seven, eight wounds, which was pretty good. I believe that was one crit, two normal hits. His second attempt did a further six with one crit and one normal hit. But it wasn't done then, he spent his uh, two, uh, double six rather on virulent Discharge. We saw that last time, he is just puking up stomach acid, bile and whatever else you choose to believe on a target within, I think it's within four inches either way. You roll dice equal to the value of the ability, so in this case it was six dice. And for every four plus you deal one additional wound. That managed to chip off an additional three. So in total, that is 17 wounds in one turn with the help of that double to the Knight of Shrouds, leaving the Knight of Shrouds with three wounds left. He and the um, Wielder of the Blade are identical in the sense that they both have 20 wounds and toughness for, so it didn't really matter who he swung at because they were both full health, more or less. So he opted to go for the Knight of Shrouds just to style on him, basically, and did really well. The Tomb Banshee, who made use of her fly keyword to just ignore scenery, basically, hopped on up onto here and then used her ranged attack, which I think is called... It's not called Howling Banshee, it can't be. Ghastly Hell, that's the one. Range 10, no minimum. Two attacks only at strength 4, but a 2-5 split for damage. Into the Harbinger, and managed to scream right in his ear. Pointed and screamed at him, like Invasions of the Body Snatchers or something. And did four more wounds. So that's him up to, let's see, what's he at? 9, 10, he's at 15. So he hasn't got too many going for him either. But we still have, well, who else can even get over there? The Spirit Hosts have Fly as well, but they don't have a ranged attack, so I think they'd probably have to double move this turn. So it's looking good for the Rockbringers getting off to an early start and having the damage curve go in their favour. There's still more activations left, though. There's three to the Night Haunts, two, because they had less starting on the table. So let's see what happens. Well, it is a little awkward to get a view on, but the Lord of Plagues activated, and the original plan was that he was going to flee using the plus one extra movement from the Sonorous Toxin just to run away a couple times because no one was engaged with him so he didn't need to disengage. But sensing that there was a chance to kill the Knight of Shrouds, he instead moved into close combat with him, moving within an inch and attacking with his plague-ridden great blades, three of them at strength five, so he was needing threes, three five damage split, he got three hits, two of which were crits, so he did a staggering 13 wounds to the Knight of Shrouds that had three wounds left, and unfortunately for him, that is one ghost that has been thoroughly busted. Last activation of the first round for the Night Haunts was the Spirit Host who opted just to move twice for a total of 12 inches of movement. He has the fly keyword as well. So he flew up onto this platform and then flew across to engagement range with the Nurgle Sorcerer over here. Being a literal roadblock for him, so he's going to have to disengage if he wants to go try and do something else. Or he might just have to stand there and fight, which isn't the best of matchups on the assumption that the Spirit Host has a... I think it's a triple he needs. Because he has a very frightening ability that makes every um, uh, successful attack action count as a crit. But I believe it's on a triple, so they would have to make sure they have a triple for the next turn to make use of that. But if they do, their crits do 3 damage and they have 6 attacks... So it is a potential for an exceptionally large amount of damage on the assumption they get that triple. But that's him done for the first round. They'll have the reinforcements coming on round two. Uh, Sepsimus still gets to go and so does the Chaos Sorcerer. Not sure what they're both doing yet. Uh, we might cover them both at the same time if Sepsimus just decides to move. We'll see. Well normally Sepsimus only moves three inches but thanks to starting within seven of the Sonorous Toxin he was moving four so he, he still used just both actions for a double move to get into base to base with the bearer of the blade up here to help out the harbinger and the lord of plays because again they're the ones with the targets on their back although right now i think they've got a pretty good control of the battlefield and finally the rockbringer sorcerer just decided to bop the spooky knife wielding ghosts on the head with his staff and actually only got one success in each attempt but both of those were crits so he actually did eight wounds he's a one four split on his wooden stick 
problem with that is though that spirit hosts have 28 wounds so yeah he did eight there's still 20 more to chip through so uh he's he's not exactly gonna kill it anytime soon and that was a very lucky result there but that does take us to the end of the first round there's no point scoring or anything to cover like that because of the way the win loss condition is working but in terms of you know who's got control of the battlefield it is the rock bringers they've managed to take out the knight of shrouds which is really lucky for them the Harbinger of Decay is uh, close to death, 10 wounds left, roughly. So it's looking bad for him, but there's still two more to chip through after that. So let's see where the reinforcements come on, and then we'll cover the dice for the next turn as well. As we begin round two for the Night Haunt, the Scriptor of the Sentence and the Bear of the Block come in from this battlefield edge right here, so they have to deploy within three inches of the actual edge and they're behind the enemy lines basically the raw bringers are all facing that way it gives them a chance to get in from behind and try and even the odds a little bit and over on this edge of the table gulgok the butcher and his blight king with blighted weapon friend have both come on bad for them because they have to start from this battlefield edge they'll probably be a little bit further forward but they move super slow so they're going to need to take a turn just getting into combat which gives the Night Haunts a good chance, but let's go see how the dice shake out. So once again, the Night Haunts did very well with their initial roll, just getting a double six and four singles in terms of going for priority, that is. They have used their wild dice again to make a triple six, I wonder why. The initial Nurgle roll had a couple of doubles, they had double six, double four, and two singles. They have used their wild die to make a triple six. So just leaves them with the two singles, which means the Night Haunts are taking first activation in round two. So as fun as it would have been to see the Spirit Haunts kick off with spending that triple just stab, 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 and the Sorcerer, that was not the play. The triple was spent by the Tomb Banshee who activated on Spectral Summon. You select a friendly fighter that's been taken down, set that fighter up on the platform or battlefield, wholly within three inches of that fighter, and they remove a number of wounds up to the value of the ability. So the Knight of Shrouds is back in Pog form, minus six wounds, so he's got 14 damage on him. And then for the Tomb Banshee's actual turn, she moved over here onto the bridge and then screamed at the Harbinger of Decay again, getting a single hit of the two through. But once again, it was a crit for five more damage, taking the Harbinger to 20. So he is almost taken down. Well, we have to look over this side of the table because the Harbinger of Decay activated. He did a disengage action, i.e. a three inch move directly away from opponents. He can't end in uh, within an inch of an enemy. Then he did a normal movement action of his six inches so he is running away slightly down here he then spent their triple six on unnatural regeneration as long as you don't have an enemy fighter within an inch of you you heal to the value of the die spent so he has healed six wounds and now only has 14 on him the recently returned to the land of the living uh, slash undead knight of shrouds activated floating down from or dropping down either way from the platform he was respawned on to attack the blight king with sonorous toxin not doing great on the attack roll, needing fours, but the one hit he did get was a crit for four damage of his 20 wounds. Sepsimus activated for the Rockbringers. He is out of line of sight, but he is there attacking the Bearer of the Blade. First attack managed just a single hit through, or sorry, well, three hits through, um, but only for three damage because he does one damage if it isn't a crit. He does five if he gets a crit. His second attempt to attack he did nothing at all. Big whiff. So then he spent their double, it was a double four, on Verlant Discharge to just puke on the Bear of the Blade and did manage to get him for two extra wounds there. So in total, that Spooky Ghost is up to six wounds now of his 20. The scripter of the sentence down here decided to start yelling out some wild accusations at the Blight King with Sonorous Toxin and its minimum range is three and he is actually just outside of range three so he could do it. Maximum range eight, I think. It's three... Uh, dice at strength 3 I believe yep with 1 3 damage his first attack managed a single crit to get through for 3 damage his second attack whiffed and did nothing so that's the Blight King up to 7 now of his 20 well now that Blight King has done something that you can accuse him of because he turned around to face his attacker and swung with his sonorous toxin twice into the night shroud got a single crit in the initial attack for five wounds which was not enough to seal the deal he needed to do one more damage than that and thus had to use his other action to attack again he got another crit through at that point it was overkill he did 10 wounds to something that at that point had 
well, he started with, what, four wins left? So the Knight of Shrouds has once again bid us farewell and is removed from the table, but it took him his whole turn to do it, so he's still kind of isolated there, just waiting to be picked on. The bearer of the block went in to have a little polite word, with the Blight King moving in to close combat and swinging that massive anvil at him, getting uh, only one normal hit and one crit, I believe, for a total of four damage. We'll consolidate those damage numbers in a second, but the Blight King is still kicking. The Rockbringer Sorcerer's Bonk Staff failed him this turn when all he was able to do against the Spirit Hosts with their vast 20 wounds remaining was a single wound across two attacks with his staff, so not a great outcome compared to the first round. There is a vicious fight going on over there. It's a shame it's still a little obscured by the scenery, but the Wielder of the Blade activated. He's locked in combat with Sepsmith, so he decided just to swing at him, and I think he is the bigger threat compared to the Knight of Shrouds. Only two attacks, but that's strength 5 in the 3-6 split. His first set of attacks to Sepsimus did 6, and his second set of attacks did 9. So that is, uh, what, 6 and 9, that's 15 of Sepsimus's 26 wounds, gone just like that. The Lord of Plagues debated whether or not to actually go in against the Bearer of the Blade, Wielder of the Blade, but decided to in the end because he is also strength 5, so also hits like a truck, and he rolls 3 dice although a 3-5 split instead of a 3-6. He did manage to do six more wounds though to the Wielder of the Blade and that is him up to 12 now of his 20 wounds. Last activation of the second round for the Night Haunts was the Spirit Host who engaged with the uh, Robbringer Sorcerer. Six attacks but only two of them got through. Strength 3 versus Toughness 3 as well. So it's a 1-3 split and as a result just did two damage the sorcerer's wounds are going to be tracked down here just because otherwise there isn't enough room uh, there's only two activations to go for nurgle now gogok and the other blight king they're probably just going to move because they are very far from combat so we'll be back in just a second to show you where they ended up so we can kind of see where both of them ended up the blight king with the scythe just moved a total of six inches across two movements to there gogok decided to come down and help protect the harbinger down here coming around the tree and stopping where you can see him. That takes us to the end of the second round again, there is no points. Um, the Night Hunt still have two turns left to kill their targets. The Harbinger has healed himself though, so that's going to be a bit tougher. The Lord of Plagues is still at full health. The Blight King with the Sonor's Toxin is definitely the closest to death, so things might not be great for him next round, but that's us going into the top of round three of a potential four. And at the top of round three, here's how the dice are looking. The Night Hunts have once again taken first activation, only rolling a double two, which they've used their wild die to make into a triple, but they've got those four singles. The Robbringers rolled a triple three and a double four, although they've used their wild dice to make another triple, because they know they're going second, because they had a single single. So we'll see what happens. And the Night Hunts, I mean, the Night Hunts are technically losing, even though it doesn't seem like it. The bearer of the block got round three started trying to take out one of their three targets by just swinging that anvil again at the Blight King with the Sonorous Toxin. Consolidated the damage down already, but across a series of two attacks, the second of which was much better with two hits and a crit, he did a total of six wounds, so that's 17 now on him. So he's getting there, but still got a ways to go. Well, it was a tough decision of who to go first for the Rockbringers, but the Lord of Plagues eventually went, swinging those Plague Ridden Great Blades, three attacks, strength fell, uh, tw strength 12, strength 5, sorry. Uh, he almost did 12 damage in one swing. He actually did 11 across two crits and, oh no, one crit, sorry, and two successes. And more than enough that, unfortunately, Hedman's Curse boss is out of there, and with his second action, he decided, well, I've killed one spooky ghost, my work here is done and started just walking off towards... Oh wait, no, if he walks towards the battlefield edge at the top of the next turn, he counts as dead, doesn't he? He has to be within four. Oh, if he has to be within four, he might have accidentally just killed himself, and that was a genuine error, so we're not going to undo it. That's hubris right there. The Harbinger is definitely not within four. If it's within three, he's still fine. If he's within four, he's dead at the top of the final round. <laughs> Whoops. The Tomb Banshee activated, hopped it down off the bridge and decided to have a who can make the more annoying noise contest with the Sunrise Toxin wielding Blight King, screaming in his ears and if both of them had been a crit she would have killed him. But she got a crit and a normal hit uh, doing 7 damage to him in total, leaving him on, let's see, 17, 18, 21, 24, oh leaving him on one wound I think. 
Oh, and also, it is within four inches of the battlefield edge, so a lot of plague stupidity has just got himself killed when the turn rolls over. Well, knowing that he can't get away because the Tomb Banshee is blocking his back, and if he had dis did a disengage, it'd have to be in this direction, and that just means the scripter of the sentence can do his ranged attack on him. The Sonorous Toxin Building Blight King decided to go down fighting, just taking two, t uh, two actions of swinging at the bear of the block, and very consistently getting the exact same result twice of a crit and a hit, I believe. In total, doing 10 damage, 5 damage across each attack, uh, putting the bear of the block on half health. If we just consolidate those down now, like that. He's probably about to die, though. And sure enough, that is exactly how it went down. The script of a sentence shouted, Oi, you did that thing, I know you did it. Only got one normal hit through for one wound, but hey, that's enough. So one of the three targets that needs to die is now dead. The other one got himself eaten by a spooky ghost waiting outside the map, I guess. Which means just the Harbinger is the last target now. And the scripter used his other action to start moving towards said Harbinger, because that's the only person they need to kill. Well, the Harbinger of Decay activated, suddenly feeling very self-conscious about his survivability, and backed up onto the ramp there a little bit. He is not within four of the table edge, made very sure of that because of his old base. And he spent the triple four on the virulent regeneration, or sorry, the unnatural regeneration to heal four more wounds, putting him back to just ten on him. So that seems like the best bet to try and win, so that's what they're doing. He's got the Blight King there to help defend him. He's got Golgog just off your screen down here, so hopefully that'll be enough. The Spirit Host activated, still taking umbrage with the Rotbringer Sorcerer's existence and took some swipes at him, six attacks twice, and did much better than he has been doing, getting uh, quite a few crits across both. His second set of attacks was three crits and two hits. So his first attack, though, did a total of six damage. His second did 11. With the two damage he already had on him, that is 11, 17, 18, 19, which puts the Sorcerer at three wounds remaining, but I believe that was the last activation for the Night Haunts this turn, whereas the Rotbringers still have Gogok, the other Blight King, and Sepsimus. Oh, how could I forget the Sorcerer himself? He bopped, bumped, booped, booped, that's the word, booped the ghosts on the head for exactly two more damage, putting them up to 11 wounds in total. Sepsimus got into engagement range with the Tomb Banshee, basically just trying to tire up in combat for the final turn, and um, did really well with his attack, his one attack he could do, he got two crits and a hit through for 11 wounds on the Tomb Banshee. And to end off the round we just had a bit of movement. Gogok the Butcher moved twice in order to get into engagement range with the Scripter of the Sentence, so to try and stop him attacking the Harbinger, because that's all they need to do, the Harbinger just needs to live. And the Blight King with the Scythe just moved into a better position to support him right there. Uh, that Oh, there is one more thing we have to do. Content with murdering a giant ghost with an even larger sword in his hands, the Lord of Plagues walks home, walks into the darkness, and is never heard from again. He is dead. And here is how the rolls worked out at the top of the final round. The Night Hunts are going first again. They had only a double five, which they turned into a triple. And then the four singles there. The Rotbringers had a double five, double six. They've used their last wild die to turn the double six into a triple six. I wonder what they're going to do with that. And just two singles. So can the Night Haunts even win with a lot of their units tied up in combat already and being outnumbered in general, it's not looking good, especially given that the Harbinger can just now heal himself as long as he doesn't have an enemy in range. He has to stay away from four inches of the battlefield edge though, so he can't really run anywhere, as it were. He kind of has to just hang around where he is. So we'll see. Step one of a very convoluted plan for the Night Haunts began with the script of the sentence being the first to activate for the round disengaging from Gogok in order to do his ranged attack on the Rockbringer Sorcerer, shouting accusations, he's browsed his internet history, and actually got a hit and a crit through for four damage in total, much more than the two, I don't know, he only he had three left, right? So just enough, almost, uh, to finish off the Sorcerer and remove him as a potential threat, and more importantly, freeing up the very quick flying Spirit Host. It's cheesy, but he had to do it. The Harbinger of Decay was the first one to activate, spending that triple, because there wasn't an enemy within distance, to regenerate six more wounds, putting him only at four, which definitely reduces their chances of being able to snatch him. But um, we'll see. The spirit, if the Spirit hosts with their six attacks and being able to spend that triple so every hit counts as a crit, it is possible they're only going to get one attack off because they'll have to fly over there. 
So the crit on the crit damage is three. So on the assumption that every single hit was a success, which it won't be, but let's assume for a second it was, that would be what, 12, 18, 18 wounds? That isn't quite enough. And I'm not sure if they have anyone else who could reach. So even if he rolled perfectly, I think it's still over, but let's see what happens. Well, we're sticking right here because the spirit hole swooped down from on top of the ledge with its flying, spent that triple on frightful touch until the end of the uh, this fighter's activation, count each hit from its melee attack actions as a crit hit instead. But he whiffed his roll, he got two hits through, he needed fives, um, but he got two of them, one of them was a natural crit. So in total that was only six wounds, putting the Harbinger back to ten, and with the Banshee tied up in combat over on your left, if we just pan back a little bit, with the Banshee tied up in combat with Sepsimus, the bear of the block is free, he's got six inches of movement. Actually, does he have range on his attack? Because he has a big chain. Um, no, he's range one and he moves six. Could he do it in one? Because he can fly. I'm not sure if that's within one. We're going to have to carefully measure that because he might have a chance to get one set of attacks in. Although I will, I'm not sure how much damage he would do even if he did a perfect move. Let's quickly check that. Um, it should technically be the Rockbringer's turn, but you know it doesn't really matter what they're doing. All that matters is if the Harbinger dies, or can die, because if he can't, the game is over. Yeah, with some careful measuring, it isn't possible for him to get within range 1 to do an attack. Uh, because the Rockbringers have an activation first, the Blight King with the Scythe here could just body block a little bit, stand right in front of the Harbinger, which makes it even more impossible, if that's a thing to get within range like it wasn't possible before but with him there you'd have to go to the side of him which would be an extra inch or an inch and a half so that isn't happening his maximum damage payout in an attack would have been 8 12 yeah 12 which would not have been enough on top of the 10 he had to take him out because i think he has 25 i always forget how much the harbinger has yeah he has 25 so there's no need to play the rest of the round the harbinger and the Lord of Plagues, if it hadn't made a silly mistake as well, also would have survived. So it is going to be a Rockbringer's victory today. And that is going to do it for the third showing of Warcry on the channel. Third game ever, so please do keep that in mind for anything done incorrect or slightly missed. Uh, but someone did mention that there is more balanced potential battle setups. Like there's a symbol for when you're rolling for deployment and victory condition. The Games Workshop feels is more balanced, so there's less chance of a, a one-sided. Not that this was one-sided, but I'm just mentioning it on note on camera. Um, I am still going to do full randoms when we select things. I, I like it that way. My favourite genre of video game is roguelike. I, I don't mind leaving it to RNG, and sometimes that means it's going to be hideously unfair for one side. Sometimes it's going to be perfectly balanced, and sometimes it's you know it's it's going to be all over the place. But that does mean on those rare occasions where it is one-sided, if the underdog happens to win it'll be amazing and that's the, the stuff you're striving for. So first showing of the Night Haunts again they had a little bit of a points deficit it was like 960 or 70 versus 990. There is a more efficient way to uh, have their list for sure. If you drop the Tomb Banshee you could put in the Sharpener of the Blade again plus another Chain Rasp to have another body on the field. The Spirit Holes didn't pop off as much as I was thinking it would. You see six dice and you see a triple that lets every hit be a crit and you think, wow, that is amazing. But it's only strength 3, and they've got to just roll those high numbers. It has the potential to do a lot of damage, but it didn't this time. Um, the Rotbringers, they, they do well against the Night Haunts on this type of mission. It, them being the defender, them winning that roll to select that they were the defender, was key. Because if they were the attacker, the Night Haunts would have just given them the runaround, and would have been pretty safe. One of the night haunts could have flown on top of the the church there, which would take like two turns for any of the rock bringers to get up there. So just thinking of it, imagine this was the other way around, and the rock uh, bringers were the ones attacking. It would have been so difficult for them. If they got into close combat, they could probably kill the night haunts pretty fast. You saw that happening, but getting into combat and sticking them in combat would have been really really difficult for them. Uh, so uh, yeah, it would have been completely different if the roles were reversed for sure. Anyway, that is going to do it for another showing for Warcry. Thank you very much for watching. Please do remember to show your support if you want to see more of this in the future so I know where to prioritise the channel's efforts. 
And if you want to go above and beyond to support what we do here, please do consider becoming a channel member or pressing the thanks button. Or if you're looking to buy some miniatures of your own, consider going through the affiliate link uh, in the description box to go through to Noble Knight Games, who are a channel sponsor. Thank you for watching either way, though, and hopefully see you for something else real soon. Until then, start for now.